I want, wanted to try to give you some tools, which I use, that can help you learn about Oregon soils that are available on the web. But just before we start, uh, there's some important services that soils provide and critical functions for sustainable production, production are to provide a suitable root zone. And uh, Scott talked a little bit about a suitable root zone. And I agree with Scott that one of the key factors is good drainage. What we say in California and the Napa region and elsewhere, Sonoma, is if you can't control water, you can't control the vine. And if you can't control the vine, you can't control quality. And if you don't have a well-drained soil, you cannot control water. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Soils provide a nutrient supply, but I think the nutrient supply is a little less important than the water factor. That's because you can mitigate any nutrient problem you might encounter uh, through foliar applications or side dress applications or through drip emitter injectors, but you can't control the soil water reservoir. You have no control of the soil water reservoir, more so if you have uh, good drainage, but less so if you don't. And so one of the key critical functions for sustainable production is being able to regulate and control the water supply of the soil. And so I'm gonna to try to teach you how to calculate water supply in soils so you know what you're dealing with. Other critical functions include uh, those for a sustainable, sustainable environment, and one is water retention. You know, the critical function for water retention is that with the quantities of rain we had in Northern California over the last four days, you could have massive floods. Fortunately, our, unfortunately, but fortunately for this storm, our reservoirs were all empty so we could catch all that water. But having water retention in soils is not only in vineyards, but in ecosystems in general is a really critical uh, service that soils play. Resistance to erosion. There's a website where you can look at the erosion uh, factor the erosion hazard of your soil once you know what kind of soil you're working with. Resilience to compaction. Cover crops help with that. Uh, ability to sequester carbon. That's new on the block. There's a large uh, focus on carbon sequestration to uh, mitigate greenhouse gas footprints. In vineyards, it's not as critical a problem as it is in crops like uh, almonds and walnut. Those are high nitrogen demand crops. They produce a lot of the greenhouse gas known as nitrous oxide, but in vineyards, hopefully we're not applying nearly as much nitrogen because of this bigger issue. And nutrient retention. Uh, we have a focus now on nitrogen retention in vineyard soils in California because of the problem with nitrate contamination of groundwater. Recent report and legislation out of the uh, Senate and the legislature has required California growers to have a CPA sign off on how much nitrogen they're going to apply. And they have to know the amount of nitrogen produced by the soil, the amount of expectation of nitrogen uh, takeoff from the crop harvest. Uh, it's a fairly complex situation, but you cannot apply nitrogen in California anymore unless the CPA uh, signs off for that. So here's the soil web that I usually work with. The NRCS, National Research Conservation Service, USGS, has a soil web application, but I find it a little more clunky than this one. This is the UC Davis uh, Land, Air, and Water Resources Department soil web app, and I'll go through it in some detail with you so you know how to use it. Uh, it's a little less clunky. It's very user-friendly. When you go to this site, everybody's finished writing that down? And pictures, so forth? Okay. Uh, you, are, you have a, a, a menu that includes a number of soil web apps. Um, I prefer the one that works with Google Earth, the <laughs> soil web earth application. How many people in here use Google Earth? Oh, a lot, okay, good. It's very easy to download it to your computer. 
Um, but there's four other, three other functions that you can use, and one includes a, an iPhone app where you can access this on the iPhone, just like the, the NRCS uh, soil web function. So this is Google Earth, and what I did uh, was just searched Medford, Oregon. And it, the nice thing about Google Earth is it allows me to store a lot of my places that I visit. So it, it's, uh, it's a link that gives me easy access to those places. So I went to Medford, Oregon, and what pops up immediately on this is these uh, contour lines. And these contour lines are what no, is known as STATSCO, and that acronym is for the States. Soil Survey Geologic Database. Uh, don't ask me how they got that acronym for State Soil Survey Geologic Database, but that's what it's called. And it's, it's a very coarse uh, a, a contour interval. In other words, it groups soils by uh, commonalities that are not very useful in terms of trying to uh, delineate what kind of soil you're standing over. In other words, if we say we're interested in this area uh, here because there's a piece of property for sale or something like that, if you click on that within that contour interval, you'll get a breakdown of the soils that are in that interval. 12% uh, Medford, 8% Oh, I can't read it. 8% uh, bunch, central point, 8%, and so on. So it's not terribly useful in terms of... Am I out of focus? No. Oh. It, it's okay. I think I've gotten the point calls. So if you use the zoom tool on Google Earth to zoom in closer, so let's say we take that area that we're interested in, we have a parcel in here that we're interested in and we zoom in using the zoom tool to be a little closer. What will happen is it'll, it'll change from these uh, white stats go lines to the soil survey geologic database and you'll get finer resolution. So let's say this is the property we're interested in and we're anticipating perhaps the purchase of that property and establishment of a vineyard. So if we go into this contour area here, what pops out is 84% uh, Medford and 12% something else. <laughs> but it's, it's a finer resolution, so we know that if we're in 84% Medford in, in this region here, then probably the majority of the soils are that, the Medford uh, classification. And what it does is it gives you a general soil profile from the pits that were excavated here. So an AP horizon to about 10 centimeters, an A horizon to about 20, uh, BT1, BT2, and this is a big mineral soil. This is, uh, this is a deep soil. So then we know that, one, we have two different soil types in here, and where this line is drawn, I don't know how they define that, but usually they use uh, vegetation surveys to define where that soil change occurs. So you can't do that in agriculture any agriculture situations, but maybe they dug a pit here and a pit here, and then I don't know how they establish these somewhat imaginary lines. They are from old soil surveys and ongoing soil surveys. This gets updated continuously. The Medford data was updated uh, September of 2015. So you, you, they're, they're ongoing. Uh, and they're always seeking out new data. And that area there is a little bit different. It's composed of about four different, uh, or five different, two, four, six different soil types, but about 80% of it is uh, whatever this soil type is. Uh, okay. And where they draw these lines is not terribly accurate. So you may, 
not re you can't rely on this. You know, actually, I've gone out to the field and checked this. They said that there's a sandbar and a little uh, tongue like this, and it was there. It was honestly there. And I, but most people assume that these are anywhere from 10 to 20 meters off of reality. And I'll get back to that later in the talk. So once you're on, you have established that this is a Medford uh, type soil, 84%, then if you click on the Medford soil, it goes to a link that gives you further information on that soil type. <coughs> and each of these soil indexes has, indices has a link to it. So for example, if we wanted to look at the story index, the story index is a land classification index, uh, mainly used for agricultural purposes, land use. And if you scroll down, you can get other information like uh, when we evaluate soils, we usually look for hazards. pH is a primary concern and pH in this case, that's the case at. I'm assuming that's pH, yeah, about 6.5. That, that's a reasonable pH for a soil. What you want to look for in a hazardous soil is pH is down in the low 5 uh, range, 5.0 to 5.5 or even lower. Um, one thing that popped out at me is this. This is an argillic uh, soil, and Scott talked about that a little bit, and you can see that the clay content past the AP, AP and the A horizon jumps up pretty dramatically. So that could potentially be a hazard if it has uh, excessively high clay contents. Getting towards 40%, so we can look at that in a little more detail because sometimes these also have things like lab data. Not all of these have links to lab data. Um, when you go to lab data, often what you get is, uh, what you get first is if you can identify the county, the state and the lab pedon number. I don't know exactly where to find the lab pedon number, but if you play around with it, you can find the lab pedon, pedon number. You probably have to, have to register to use the NRCS site. So this links to the NRCS site. And you can enter this information and go directly to it. Or if you scroll down, am I, can people hear me okay? Okay, all right. You can see uh, uh, the, all these red dots are the places where they took excavation, they dug soil pits, and did laboratory analyses. Uh, these have biogeochemical data. These mostly have textural data, pH, and things of that nature. So again, I zoomed in on uh, Medford. So Medford is right here. And I tried to get a, a pedon that was within the area of interest that I was looking at. Uh, with the USGS NRCS site, you usually have to define an area of interest. So you square out that uh, area where the parcel is. But I, I've always found that a little more clunky than using the Google app or uh, UC Davis app. And then that takes you to the laboratory data sheet. And in the laboratory data sheet, it has texture, sand, silt, and clay, uh, rock content, um, and other parameters that are useful. So uh, how many of you are familiar with the soil triangle? Okay, not, not as many. The soil triangle allows you to use those percent values to determine what kind of texture uh, you have and what the drainage class is. And we usually look for soils and, and we turn it upside down and draw it like this. You want to avoid these extreme areas. Uh, high sand soils have uh, low aeration, or high silt content soils have low aeration. They tend to be hard and they can compact and they can develop hard pans like dura pans. Uh, sandy soils have low water and nutrient holding capacity. High clay content soils have low aeration and they're very plastic, which means roots don't grow well in them. <clears throat> That's why you want to put 
Sauvignon Blanc on a big root stock because the big root stocks are a little bit better at uh, exploring those areas if you're in this region. And a lot of the uh, soils that Scott referred to that are serpentinic, like the Maxwell clays, can have clay contents up to 70 and 80 percent, and, and magnesium contents are just huge. But this middle area, this inverted triangle area, gives you an area that you can use to know that you're going to have pretty good drainage in all these different soil types and pretty good nutrient retention capacity. If we go back to the data sheet, uh, if we look at the sand silt clay contents, we got about 45% silt, about 23% uh, clay. That jump up, so when I'm evaluating this soil, uh, at least from this pit, and I don't know if that pit was taken exactly over that parcel, but the increase in clay content in this analysis doesn't seem to be represent a hazardous situation. 45 and 23% uh, silt and clay content puts that soil about here. So if we've got about 45% clay, about 23% uh, clay, 23% clay, 45% silt, and then about 31% sand. So we know we're in that region that is going to be a well-drained soil. But the proof in the pudding and the thing you really need to do is dig soil pits. And you can see this is uh, Corey. And as you can see, when I hire people to work in the lab, students to work in the lab, I try to get the football player types. <laughs> the ones that when I go out to the field with them, they say, stand back, Dr. Smart. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see that we've excavated a pit behind him, and we've, he's right at the edge of where we excavated a second pit. And what he's trying to do is, we know that there's one of these imaginary soil survey lines somewhere between this pit and this pit. And what we're trying to do is take a series of cores on a transect to see where we, if we can find out where that transition occurs a little more accurately than you would just by looking at the soil survey map. Uh, that's Shake Ridge Vineyards before Adam Kramer planted it. And one thing you want to look at in these pits, one thing I want to emphasize very strongly here is if you dig a pit and it's like this one, two meters deep, and I, and I also hire women in the lab, of course, and this is Nicole Nehus. She's as strong as any football player. And, but you want to reinforce it. You know, there's so many cases where people have gone into pits that are above about waist deep and, and have perished because the sides gave in. So make sure you reinforce those pits. And what Nicole is doing is uh, she's looking at the rooting depth, the effect of rooting depth, and you can see that there's roots coming down to a, at least a meter. She found that about, even though there were deep roots in this system, that about 80 to 90 percent of the roots were in the upper meter. This is in an almond orchard, actually. It's not in a vineyard. That's why these roots are so large uh, in size. This is a soil pit that was from the Shake Ridge Vineyard. Sometimes you can't see roots because, you know, you don't have woody perennial species. You have grass roots down to about the upper uh, 20 centimeters or so, and not many going beyond that. You can see that there's some of those roots you can see poking out from the wall. But what I know from this pit and the evaluation is that this area here, which is a red soil, but a young, younger red volcanic soil, uh, it's in the Auburn series, uh, and uh, the high sand content means that we'd have a rooting depth to about the first uh, 75 centimeters of depth. And then we get into this bed uh, parent material. It's mostly bedrock material. Uh, it's decomposing, uh, but it's not uh, in any condition that roots are going to be able to forage for much water at that depth, beyond the 75 centimeter depth. And we use this uh, rooting depth information to, one thing we talked about last night is at the dinner is how uh, some of the California vineyards are much larger than the Oregon vineyards. 
But that's mostly in the Central Valley region uh, where, you know, farming is operating on low margins and they're harvesting, you know, a hundred acres a night to feed the gallo machine. But in these smaller vineyards where we're trying to work on controlling water, we may block this vineyard. This, this is pits M7, M1, M4. These are all pit locations where we did rooting profiles. And we may block this vineyard like this, which would change it from about eight acres to about a five acre uh, irrigation block and about a three acre irrigation block. And you can see that the reason I'm doing that is because we have deeper rooting depths here. So they explore a greater uh, fraction of the soil water reservoir than these. So this is a, a swale, this is a toe slopes, bottom of the hill. These are mid slopes and these are upper slopes. And we know that generally speaking, theoretically, the upper slopes have shallower soils than the toe slopes. And so rather than try to modify the irrigation system as a first cut, we try to develop two irrigation blocks in this vineyard, a five acre and a three acre. And then we have better control of our water and our uniformity in the vineyard overall. Uh, there are some tools that can help with this. You know, it's like, do I have to go out there and take so many cores? Because soil analyses are expensive. And yes, there are uh, tools that can help us with this. What we use is the Geonics EM38. And what it does is it sets up an electromagnetic field in the soil. And the propagation of that electromagnetic field is related to the uh, what we refer to as the parent electrical conductivity. So if you think about it, you, you do not hold uh, an extension cord and stand in water with bare feet, right? Well, it's the same thing with this thing, you know, clay, high clay content soils have higher conductivities because they retain water and they have small pore size and they retain uh, electrolytes like magnesium and sodium. And sandy soils have lower conductivities. So we use the Geonics EM38 to, uh, try to determine where these changes in soil types are occurring. And this is an old picture you can tell because we don't wear these antenna things on our backpacks anymore. And you know what? Women are smarter than men. That's been one of the suppositions of my life. You know, they, they, they put this EM38 on a sled and then tow it through the window and say, hi, honey, I'll be home for lunch. Enjoy your walk. And so the EM38, it was originally made for evaluating uh, salinity, sodium and chloride contents of soil. And you can see that it has a very strong uh, relay. This is EC and this is soil sodium content. It has two dipolar positions. One is the vertical and one is the horizontal. So this is the vertical and the horizontal. And this one, uh, the vertical goes to about 1.5 meters depth and the horizontal goes to about 0.75 meters depth. And it can help with detecting, for example, an argillic horizon because an argillic horizon, a clay, high clay content horizon, they often aren't flat, you know, you don't find them at the same depth, but they undulate. And so where they undulate, you can get uh, perched water tables and things of that nature that you might want to avoid. Uh, soil clay content, it's positively correlated with clay content, as I previously mentioned, and then negatively correlated with sand content. Uh, and what we do is we map that out. And what I want you to take notice here, so this A, B, C, A, B, C, D, E, F are different times of the season when water contents of the soil, this is spring where water content is high and these are getting down to fall where water content is quite low in the inner row areas. <clears throat> these, this is a map of the vineyard and these dots are where we took uh, core samples to look at soils. But these maps show the electrical conductivity from the EM38. And what we found is we decided, well, we want to put a pit here in this region because we want to know what's going on with this region and why it's so different from these other areas of the soil. And what we found is if you look at clay content, it had a very low clay content. Basically, there is a sandbar here. So we were able to 
capture that sandbar in a, in a manner that allowed us to minimize our sampling protocol uh, and therefore diminish expense. So how about the soil water reservoir? Well, I mentioned that we want to have an effective rooting depth. I mean, you can't do an actual rooting depth. I mean, you'd have to, for grapevine, you know, that can root to six meters or something like that, you know, it's just impossible to do. So we get to capture something that we call the effective rooting depth, where, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the roots are hanging out. Remember that water has a positive and a negative charge density. The negative charge density is around oxygen and the positive charge density is where the hydrogen atoms are located. And that's why water is what it is. It sticks together and that sticking together determines how it behaves in soils. Wow, this worked. And that sticking together is we, so Consider this like a sand or a clay particle and when soils dry out, the water recedes into these particle pores, these pore spaces in the soil and the farther and the smaller the particle size they go into the uh, pore spaces, the harder it is for plants to extract them. So we can think of this as uh, a high sand content soil and the diameter of the, this capillary is large and the ability of water to stick to the sides of that capillary because that's glass and it's silica so it has a lot of uh, minus charges on it is much lower than the very small clay type meniscus and the elevation of this water column is synonymous with the wa soil water potential referred to as capillary wise. So this is kind of the difference between a high clay content soil and a sand content soil. Uh, the reason we irrigate is because we need to have water films in contact with the root surface in order for water and uh, mineral nutrients to be absorbed. Uh, and that's important in particular from my perspective in the spring. And what we generally do in order to estimate the soil water reservoir is we take two measurements. One at uh, field capacity. So think of this as a sponge. And you know, I do this with a sponge in my classroom and thank God I didn't bring a sponge here. I was thinking about it because there's no place I could put it. Uh, but if you take a sponge and so when you go home tonight, take a sponge and fill it with water and then very carefully lift it up and then the water will drain out and drain out and drain out and then suddenly it'll stop. That's the equivalent of field capacity, the amount of water that uh, a soil will hold beyond the gravimetric water that goes out when it's saturated. So this will go down to the uh, saturation zone and be transported out within the water table. Or if it's completely saturated, there's a lot of surface runoff as well. Then if you take that sponge and squeeze it, a lot of water will come out. You'll be surprised at how much water comes out. The difference between the field capacity measurement and what we refer to as the permanent wilting point, the uh, uh, water potential in that soil where roots can no longer extract water. We've all done this with our house plants. Uh, my wife doesn't, but I do. You know, you buy this wonderful plant and take it home and then uh, a month later you look at it and say, wow, it's dead. <laughs> oh, I forgot to water it. <laughs> So it reached the permanent wilting point and you killed it. This is a quite easy exercise to do. Uh, so this is soil moisture content gravimetrically. So all you need is a soil auger and uh, an effective rooting depth and then you take these samples down to the effective rooting depth. You dry them in an oven at 105 degrees. So you can dry them overnight in your oven. You just set it to 105. You have to translate it to Fahrenheit for most of us. And so when we dry it out, it weighs 100 grams. And the, when we sampled it fresh, it weighed 120. So we know that 20 grams of that was water, which we dried out of it. So the gravimetric water content of that uh, soil sample was about 20%. So the mass of water per mass of dry soil. Then we can convert that to a volumetric water content 
which we subscript with B, theta V and theta G is if, and then we need to know the bulk density of the soil. The bulk density is the amount of weight of soil per cubic centimeter, or per, in this case, it's per meter cubed. Uh, megagram per meter cubed is a, uh, is a gram per centimeter cubed. Either one works, they'll, they'll both be 1.25. And then we convert that gravimetric water content to volumetric water content by multiplying by the bulk density and dividing by the density of water. And then we get about 25% uh, volumetric water content. If the volumetric water content is 25% or 0.25, then the air-filled pore space is about 28%. And this is based on the bulk density measurement and the fact that soil particles have a density of about 2.6, no, 2.93 grams per cubic centimeter. You know, if you took all the pore space out and had a rock, that would be the density of it. So you can also use this to calculate uh, airspace. For a good vineyard soil, this should be at least 15%. The minimum is 15%. If you're lower than 15%, then you should probably look elsewhere for your soil. 0.25 volumetric water content, meters cubed per meters cubed. We usually refer to, the, to that as a depth of water. So in this case, 250 millimeters or about 25 uh, centimeters if you have a meter cubic meter of soil at field capacity. For most uh, well-drained situations, the wilting point would be roughly around 10%. So 25%, well, let's call it 15%, so it makes the math easier for me. If the field capacity water content is uh, 25 percent and the wilting point is 15 percent, then about 10 percent of that will be the water that can be extracted by the vine. And 10 centimeters of water is about, uh, 10 centimeters of water is about four inches, four inches of water. And this is where, where we use that soil water reservoir uh, classification. And actually, I just want to mention that uh, in the soil survey, the NRCS database, you can get a number for uh, the soil water reservoir. Per, it's usually referred to as total available water or plant available water, but I call it the soil water reservoir as, because that's the water that's available to the vine. If you look at a soil and it has 1.5 inches of water in the effective rooting zone, then irrigation is going to be critical. I don't care where you're going. So you need to make sure you have the water capacity, whether it's through uh, surface flow supply or well water supply, to meet that uh, deficit in water uh, content. At 1.5 to 4.5 inches of water in the effective rooting depth, uh, irrigation would be needed or at least desirable. Uh, you might be able at 4.5 inches to go to dryland uh, production, but not necessarily. And this is speaking for California situations where the evapotranspiration demand is quite high. I don't know what kind of evapotranspiration demands uh, you have here, but I would assume that they're probably a little lower. Uh, with 4.5 to 6 inches of water, irrigation would be optional uh, depending on evapotranspiration demand. If you have 6 inches of water in Bakersfield, forget it, you're going to have to irrigate. Uh, but if you have 6 inches of water in Napa or Sonoma County, then uh, it's optional and you can go to dryland production. At greater than 6 inches of water, dryland farming from both an environmental and production is objective is probably a good idea. Production because you won't affect production and you will have the water retention uh, function service that it's playing in the environmental sense. If you're going to go to dryland farming, this is what I recommend to growers in Napa. Don't go to dryland in year one. Don't go to dryland in year two. Don't go to dryland in year three. You want to make sure you establish a good depth to depth of the rooting zone vine before you start to go dryland. And then you want to wean them off 
of the water. So if you fully irrigate for years one, two, and three, then in year four, you may want to go to like a 50% deficit situation. In year five, 25% deficit. In year six, 10% deficit. And then in year seven, turn the water off and see how it performs. Uh, you, you definitely want to wean them off because what I teach my students is, you know, we're all confronted with the situation. If we're going to establish a vineyard or we're going to purchase a piece of property and establish a vineyard, we're going to make an investment that's, in, that's you know, thousands of dollars and we're going to have to have some kind of bank support to do that. You want to start paying off the bank as soon as possible. And so that's why you want to wean them off and make sure you're successful in that endeavor. Uh, how much time do I have? And I'm the only one standing between them and lunch? Pressure. <laughs> okay, I was hoping to spend a little more time on this. <laughs> so, just to point out a few hazards, we usually have look at the percent cation saturation, the base saturation. It's the percentage of the cation exchange capacity that's occupied by potassium, magnesium, calcium, sodium, and, and protons. You want to look at soil pH, in this case with a soil pH of 5.3. You know, you determine what you get back in your soil analysis. So if you can tell the laboratory, look, if I have a pH that's below say 5.5, then I want to have a lime requirement added to the soil analysis. Because in this case, a pH of 5.3 is not going to foster good nutrient uptake. It may potentially cause stubby root syndrome because there's probably some aluminum floating around in that soil. So ask them for, if anything's under pH 5.5, give me a lime requirement as well. Right. Uh, you want to look at the calcium to magnesium ratio, but when you calculate the calcium to magnesium ratio, you use the extractable amounts, not the percent of the base saturation. The extractable amounts, so in this case, let's see, where's a hazardous potential? This one right here, that's a calcium to magnesium ratio of about 9 to 1. What, what were we talking about? Six to one. So you may want to supplement that with a gypsum application, and you may want to supplement this one with a lime application. Um, these pH 6.0s are probably okay. That's a one to one. That's about a, that's about four to one. So we're not going to be concerned about this, but in this these are pits that were dug, and so in this area of the vineyard, we're probably going to want to do some gypsum application. And you know, if you apply gypsum to that, this was a 28-acre parcel. If you apply to gypsum to this one, you might as well just apply it to the whole vineyard because it's not, it's cheap. And it helps with infiltration and a number of other soil properties. Uh, look at your micronutrients. Usually uh, companies put, this is an Auburn soil in California, so we know that things like boron, very low, very low, very low, very low, very low, and zinc, very low throughout. Anything below about two parts per million, you're, you're going to want to have some kind of foliar program. You know, the foliar programs don't work well with the macronutrients, magnesium, potassium, but they do work remarkably well with the micronutrients. Uh, you might want a fuller or foliar, foliar program for ma manganese as well. The chelating agents they use and the expertise that they have with uh, these foliar applications are, are really remarkable. And you can get enough boron in. You want to supplement the boron with starting to build it up in the soil, so you're probably better off injecting it as well as having a foliar. But you know, in year one, year two, you're not going to be able to get the vine with a large enough root system that the uh, that the soil application is going to do it much good because you can do the foliar application uh, just past bud break when roots are not very active, but you have foliage in the canopy.
Um, so I talked a little bit about that. The other thing I teach my students is for the macronutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to be environmentally friendly or to provide an environmental service, uh, use a replacement a replacement paradigm for your nutrient strategy. So with each ton of fruit that you harvest from the vineyard, you take off about 2.5 to 4 pounds per nitrogen of nitrogen. 0.5 to 1.5 pounds of phosphorus and about 4.5 to 6.5 pounds per ton of fruit of potassium. You remove that from the vineyard, so put it back. So that nitrogen content is about 15 to 24 pounds per acre, phosphorus 3 to 9, potassium 24 to 40. And then establish a foliar program, looking at uh, pediol and leaf blade analyses of, in this case, we'll just take nitrogen, but don't throw it out each year. Use it to make adjustments. If you're below this, uh, if you're within this deficiency range, then apply nitrogen in, in spring when the uh, root zone is, uh, the, when the rooting root proliferation is most active. But then compare it year in, year out. So if you went to 2.5 and you had two at Verasion, then the next spring take the sample again. If it's 1.8, lower than 2.2, then you have to assume, well, I didn't apply enough because uh, something to do with soils. Maybe I have a sandy soil or something like that. So you apply a little bit more. You double the rate you did the year before. So look at it in terms of trending analysis, you know, for all of these major macro and micronutrients that are of concern with grapevine. And this is not my table. This comes from Ohio State University Extension. And there's a lot of this stuff out there on the uh, web that you can use to, and it differs slightly. I think the nitrate uh, index is useless, it's pretty much garbage, but these nitrogen, total nitrogen, phosphorus are useful. They're useful in determining trending analysis for where well, nutrient efficiency. Not all varieties yeah. react the same, so you, you need to also do some physical assessment of what's going on. That's right. Unfortunately, all varieties don't behave the same. So go to a place where they're, they have data, for example, they have data for Pinot Noir or they have data for Chardonnay. That's the best approach. You can also just get a plant physiology or soils textbook, and they'll have a table like this, nutrient contents of uh, approximate uh, analysis of plant material, plant leaves. And you know, if you take a analysis, a pediol analysis, and you compare it to that uh, textbook table, the, if you're experiencing a nutrient deficiency and you don't know it, it'll pop out. The nutrient deficiency will definitely pop out. Um, if you have questions, for example, if you have a question on about a soil analysis, this is what to do. Print out a hard copy, wrap it around a bottle of premium estate bottled wine, <laughs> mail it to Dr. David R. Smart, <laughs> Department of Viticulture Enology, University of California, One Shields <laughs> Avenue, Davis, California, 9. Or if after my talk you say, I'm not going to roll this up, man, I'm going to keep it flat, then put it in a FedEx envelope, tape it to the side of a case, <laughs> and then mail it to the same address. Thank you very much.